Well, good evening. It's so great to see each and every one of you here tonight. And uh, it's nice to have, not only to have our kids and our youth back with us, uh, some familiar faces that we've missed for so long, uh, but also it's great to, to have uh, our, our young folks come over here and join the adults on Wednesday night. Usually it's separate, but tonight we're going to be together. And the reason we're doing that is because tonight is a special night. We are in the middle of our missions week, and it's uh, a week that we celebrate every year. We, we try to recognize and promote and encourage and remember and, and participate in world missions. Our church has a goal to, to be witnesses and to make disciples here in, in Anvil and surrounding areas, but also near and eventually far. And far would be some of these other places you can see up on the map, other parts of the world, because we're called to take the gospel from here outward. And tonight is special because every year we, we spend a lot of time in the fall, right, leading up to Christmas and, and finishing up there in November, we put together something that we call the shoeboxes. And you guys know what this, a lot of you know what this is. You guys have helped out in VBS in the past. We do the Penny Wars to help uh, raise money to ship those boxes. And so every year our shoeboxes go to a particular place, a particular country. And we always like to have a big deal and have a big hoorah and have a big revealing or unveiling of where those shoeboxes went. And last year is no different than that we, we had shoeboxes sent out. actually had quite a few shoeboxes, a lot of shoeboxes that went out last year. And thankful for everyone that participated to help make that possible. But they went to a particular place. And tonight we're going to find out where they went. Any guesses? Anybody got a country where they think our shoeboxes went? Any guess? Kenya. Kenya. What else? Any other guesses? Anybody in the back got a guess? Anybody in the front got a guess? Japan. Okay. It's a good guess. What else? Uh, Jotham. Uh, Dubai. Yeah, or the United Arab Emirates. That's right. Maybe there. Oh, Annabelle. Which? Columbia. Hey, that's a good guess. You know, that's where our shoeboxes went last year. So last year's Columbia. year before was a country in Africa called Togo. The year before was a country called Madagascar. Most of us think it's just an animated movie, but it's an actual country. Benji. Benji, did you have, did you have a guess? All right, you think on it. We'll come back to you, okay? You let me know if you think of it. All right, now here's what we do with the shoeboxes. We pack these shoe boxes. We pack all these nice things in the shoe boxes. Then they, they pack them up. They take them. They ship them to another country. And they give them out as a gift of love. And when they give them out as a gift of love, they present and they share the gospel. They share how folks can be saved. Just as I see a Judy Pearl shirt back there says saved right across it. They tell these kids in these other countries how to be saved. And we know that there's only one way for people to be saved. Now, you're going to hear in today's world, you're going to hear people say that there's many ways to be saved and many ways to be to God, but, or get to God. But God's Word said there's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life through His death and through His resurrection. So they give these, they give these shoeboxes out. They present the gospel, but they also put them in classes where they can continue to learn the Word of God and continue to learn and hear about the gospel. When they complete this program, they give them a Bible in their own language and, and they also give them some other materials so that they can take and, and go and, and share the gospel with others, especially those that accept Christ. Now, we're going to show uh, Mr. Mike in the back. Everybody look around and look at Mike and wave at Mike and say, Thank you, Mike. Mike is going to be helping us tonight, and he's going to be showing us this first video is just a little bit about shoeboxes in, in case uh, some of you might not know a lot about them, or for some of us, it may just be a good reminder to show us the impact of shoeboxes worldwide, and then we're going to be unveiling where our shoeboxes went last year. So go ahead, Mike. Three, two, Count of three when children open the shoe boxes, they're so excited. Those faces just transform. 
Yeah, these kids behind me are so excited because they've just received their boxes. The mouth is wide open, the voice is raised, smiles are all over. That box brings joy. We're right now in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited, giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. That's what I love about Operation Christmas Child. It knows no borders, it knows no boundaries. It's all about sharing the name of Jesus Christ. Churches are doing big things with Operation Christmas Child. Everybody out there who packs shoe boxes, they are spreading God's love. It's families, it's churches, it's hundreds of thousands of volunteers that help make Operation Christmas Child so successful. We couldn't do it without them. With this box, they do get the gospel story. They do hear about Jesus. It has maximum impact in the worldwide kingdom of Christ. I mean, what better thing could you do than be involved in field shoe boxes? Some of them go by train, some go by camels, some go by ships. These boxes go all over the world, and that is only the beginning. After receiving the shoe boxes, the children will be invited to go through the greatest journey, which is a 12 lesson discipleship program where they learn about the greatest gift, which is Jesus Christ. After a child completes the greatest journey, they graduate and receive a Bible in their own language. When the light of the gospel is turned on, that changes everything. Churches are being planted, lives are being changed, communities are being transformed. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. I would like to ask you to consider packing shoeboxes year-round. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. of the boxes going, you know, in the, in the desert and on the boats and just all around the world. And then did you notice the faces of the kids when they opened? Just the sheer joy. And we know there is joy in opening a shoebox, but we also know that there is not lasting joy in that box, in that physical gift. Why? Because it's eventually going to run out, right? If they got toothpaste, it's eventually going to run out. If they got a toothbrush, it's going to wear out, right? If they got a ball, it, it might go flat, but when they offer, what they do is they offer a gift that's far greater than what's in that shoebox. And that's the gift of Jesus Christ. A gift that will never run out. A gift that will never end. That will never die. But that salvation, that relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's the beauty of this. Now, do you guys want to know where our shoeboxes went last year? Anybody want to know? All right. You guys are going to have to help me. Because we're going to have to do, we're going to do a drum, drum roll. Can you help me? Maybe, in the, maybe in, the, in the seat in front of you. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready? Three, two, what? No, no, stop, stop, stop. Are you sure you want to know? Yes. No, no, let's just go eat pizza and go home. No, no, you want to know? Okay, here we go. Let's go. Drum roll again. And they went to, no, stop, stop. We don't want to do this. Okay, here we go. Drum roll. We're going to do it. We're going to do it this time. Drum roll. And it, they went to, where did they go, Mike? Hard to reach places.
And some of you may say, what on earth is that? And, and Tetch, I'm going to need two new batteries. Sorry, my, my mic's going out. If we do that, we'll lose our folks online. Hard to reach places. What is that? I mean, anybody ever heard of that country? That's a strange country, isn't it? Is, is that maybe the 206th country? Anybody have a guess of what that might mean? Hard to reach places? There we go. All right, uh, Bella, what, what's your thoughts? On a mountain? On a mountain? Yeah, maybe, maybe geographically. Maybe the terrain is hard to get to. Or maybe it's an island. Maybe it's an island where they got to take lots of boats. I've been in places like that where you got to jump on several boats just to get to this island. That's a good, that's a good guess. Benji? That's right. We're all happy that it got their stuff. That's right. That's a good, that's a good thought, Benji. All right, here, here's what it means by hard to reach place. Okay. Do you all know that there's places in the world where you cannot openly talk about Jesus or you cannot openly read your Bible or give a Bible to someone? Did you all know that? I mean, now I we're getting closer and closer to that day in America. I mean, it, we're, we're still a long ways off, but it's getting more and more like that in America. But there's countries where people have to smuggle. They have to hide Bibles in their suitcases and things like that just to get a Bible into that country where you can be persecuted or you can suffer for being a follower of Jesus Christ or becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. So here's what's pretty neat is our shoeboxes actually went to a place that is hard to reach, where they're not very receptive and open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and more than likely, they went to a place that we sometimes call an unreached people group or an unreached place, meaning they do not have a church or many churches present to be able to share the gospel with others. So that's pretty neat. We get to, we get to do a small part and taking these gifts and taking the gospel in hard-to-reach places. And we've got a video. Mike's going to show us a video that's going to explain this a little bit better and a little bit more fully with, with videos and stuff than, than I just did. So, Mike, let's, let's show this. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Many of the countries that we're working in, they're very hostile to the gospel. They're very dangerous places where these children are growing up. A shoebox gift can really be light in a dark place. Generally, uh, Operation Christmas Child is seen as a, as a fun, lighthearted project but there's a whole other side of what we're doing. We go into places where a person can lose their life if you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of Christians are forced to flee again, facing imminent execution. There were a number of civilian casualties. We're working with local believers who uh, face incredible opposition on a, on a daily basis. Many of our believers, our friends who follow Christ, are faced constantly uh, by interrogation, by secret police, investigation, uh, burning the churches down, uh, persecuting, even, even to the extent of death. I mean, everything is, um, is kind of discreet and hidden. It is dangerous, but God has given us ways. One of the ways is these shoeboxes. 
the believers are literally putting their lives on the line to share the gospel with the next generation. And we want to be able to help them do that through the power of a, of a simple shoebox gift. I have seen these boxes go into areas of the world where there's been war. And years later, I've had people come to me and say, I was a kid and you gave a box and it changed my life. It gave me hope. Thank you, thank you. Very good. In the midst of the, the challenges that these local believers are facing, we are seeing the church grow. And so uh, we want to continue to fan that flame, continue to have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Pray for these boxes as they go to countries around the world. We need your help. Don't back off. We need your help. We need it now. What if what mattered most to you had to be a secret? At some places where churches are burnt, people... Uh, they give their lives following Christ and serving Him so that some difficult places. And, and just as we, we sh I shared earlier, we have a small part that we get to play a small part in that. Um, we're going to, Mike, we've got one more video, but I'm going to hold it off until the end. Let's switch to a, pr a presentation. Here's what I want us to do now, but, but before we do that, Mike, I want to, let's just pray. Let's pray for these hard to reach places and where our shoeboxes went as, as one body. Let's lift our brother, uh, nameless. You know, we don't know their names, but God knows their names. God knows their needs. And we know the, the difficulty. I mean, we can't fathom the difficulty and challenges that they experience. So, guys, let's, let's bow our heads, and, and we're going to pray uh, for, for some of these places. So let, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. And we praise you just that we get to participate. We get to play just a small part, a small role in taking the gospel to these difficult places, God. And we long to see your gospel take root. We long to see lives transformed by the power of the gospel. And I pray that you use these shoeboxes, God. And even if they're already delivered and handed out, Father, I pray that they would continue to produce fruit in the lives of those that they, they touched and interacted with, God. I pray that the shoeboxes would continue to open doors for brothers and sisters to enter into those countries and those hard to reach places for the gospel to go for the Bibles to be able to be handed out and spread it there in those places Father we just pray that you would use this effort in a mighty way God because we know that there are millions there are billions of people living worldwide without access to the gospel not only access to the gospel without belief in your son Jesus Christ and they're going to spend any eternity separated from you so God we pray for all these places we pray for the brothers and sisters we pray that you encourage them that you challenge them that you strengthen them God give them boldness just as you gave the early church fill them with your spirit God and I pray that you give them perseverance God I pray that they would endure to the end that they would not give up they would not stop that they would endure to the end. God, that's our hope and prayer. Use, use this ministry in a mighty way. Use our brothers and sisters worldwide. God, raise up more laborers to send into the harvest field. Thank you for this privilege. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Now, here's what we want to do. Because that's, there's not a specific country connected to these hard-to-reach places. Now, we can guess in some places. But here's what I want to do tonight. Uh, some of you, especially some of you youngsters, you may not know this, but Tetch and I and Jotham, we lived for a while in, in, a, in a country in the Middle East called the United Arab Emirates. And what I thought we would do tonight, because in many ways that country includes a lot of unreached people, and some of our previous work included work with shoeboxes, not necessarily Operation Christmas Child, but, but we used uh, shoeboxes in our ministry. So here's what I want to do tonight in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. I want to just go through a quick presentation and share with you just a little bit about our mission experience there in the Middle East. I know some of the adults have heard some of this, but some of you, you may see some pictures that you've not seen before. So I'm going to do this. So Mike is going to get a presentation ready for us. We're going to push pause on that video. If we've got time, we'll play it at the end. But if not, we will uh, we'll, we'll do this presentation. And also, I've, I've brought some things from the country where we lived. We were there for seven years, 
and, and it's kind of a Middle Eastern culture there. And I'll explain them a little bit, and you guys can come up afterwards, and you can see some of them, and, and you can kind of look at them, maybe pick them up and, and examine them. So the country is United Arab Emirates. The, the famous city there is a city called Dubai. The, the capital city, which we lived for a couple of years, our last part of our time there, is a place called Abu Dhabi. Can you all say Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi. Say it quick. Abu, Abu, Abu Dhabi. Dhabi. You know the difference between Dubai and Abu Dhabi? You see, the, the people in Dubai, they don't like the Flintstones. But the people in Abu Dhabi do. Okay, if you've never if you never seen Flintstones, that that fell. Yeah, but but you're okay. No more dad jokes. Hey, Mike, you may need to close out of Pro Presenter and then pull out uh, pull up the presentation. I want to share with you all my favorite verse in the world, and it might surprise you. And maybe it's a verse you've never even heard, but my favorite verse is Psalm one fifteen. One, And it goes something like this. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. And I, I want to, you, 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 know, you know the reason that's my favorite verse? And don't, don't worry about this. Mike's going get, to get us taken care of. When I was in college, so I came to Christ at an early age. I was seven years old. Uh, anybody seven in here? All right, Adeline, you're seven. Uh, Ad, you're seven. B, you're seven. All right, that's, that's the, the row of seven-year-old girls right there. When I was your all's age, I came to Christ. I was baptized. My, my spiritual life is kind of up and down like a lot of people's. And I left high school, went to college, and I hit a low. Hit a low in my life. And uh, several things happened. I won't get into it. But about it's at that time that I sensed... Uh, the Lord drawing me close to him. And he, he lifted me, took me out of the valley, lift me up, take, took me out of the Mari clays, we say, and put me on a mountaintop. And, and I felt closer to God during that time than I'd ever felt to God in, in my whole life up to that point. And that's when God revealed that verse to me, Psalm 115, 1. And I said, God, and this time I said, God, whatever you want me to do with my life, I'll do it. And so... That led me to that verse, and even uh, since God called me into full-time ministry during that season in my life. Didn't know what that was going to look like. Didn't know it was going to take me to the Middle East or bring me to this wonderful family of faith here at Amble Baptist. But I knew that I want to do whatever God asked of me, and I was introduced to something called the Great Commission. And Brother Fred spoke on the Great Commission this past Sunday, and the Great Commission is something like this is make disciples of all nations, make disciples of all peoples. And, and Fred's passage in Mark said to preach the gospel to all creatures, all creation. So we're preach, called to preach the gospel and make disciples. So in my commitment to, to preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, it led me to a country called the United Arab Emirates. And I'm going to pause right there. How are we doing back here? Mike? All right, we're going we're gonna to push pause. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to pass some of these around. I'm gonna, Tetz did such a good job de decorating this, but I'm going to take some of these and pass them around, okay? All right, I'm going to start this one right here. This right here is what they call the seven sands of the UAE. In the UAE, there are seven emirates. That's like seven states. And each emirate has a different color sand. And you, it's hard to see until you get a hold of it and look. But if you like twist it and turn it right here, you can see the different layers of sand. Okay, I'm going to let you start with it. You be careful. I'll let you look at it. And you pass it on back to, to Mr. Roger. Now this is their famous coffee pot. And they would take a coffee pot. Now this is a miniature, okay? They, they have a much bigger one. But they put coffee in here. And they put it on the hot fire, and they, 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 it heats the coffee up. And then they got these little cups, and they pour the, the cardamom and sugar and stuff in it, and, and they pour it, and then they, 
they pass it out. And it's a, a big, big thing for fellowship and hospitality. So you guys can take a look. You can open it up. But again, it's a miniature version there. You guys can start a uh, couple more things here. Uh, incense is a big thing in the Middle East. So this is an incense holder. So what they would do is they would take something like this and they would put a hot coal in it. And then they would put something like frankincense, which is basically uh, sap off of a tree. Do you know this frankincense? It grows in kind of that part of the world, especially over in Oman. They take these, these trees and they cut the bark. And when they cut the bark, the sap oozes out. And they take that sap and when it dries... Then it becomes incense, and when it's dried, they'll take a hot coal and they put that incense right on that hot coal. And then it, and sometimes they put their, put, you know, their clothes, or they'll, they'll take it and they'll like, and they try to, you know, make it come all over their clothes. But, but there, that's that. You walk down the malls and you just, these are all over the place. Sometimes they take frankincense and throw on the campfire. Now this, I know some, I know what some of you guys are going to do. You're going to rub this thing. Man, you, man, This we've not cleaned this in a while, and we didn't have to because you guys are going to clean it for us, okay? <laughs> Wipe it down good. And uh, this is a lamp. You know, we talk about Genie's lamp, but they put a wick here, so they put oil inside, and they put a lamp, and then they light it. And, and there, that's the way to do it. Oh, good deal. We're up and rolling. There we go. Keep going. Let's keep going next, next. All right, now go back one. There we go. So for the first few years of, of our time, my time in the Middle East, I served at a church called Emirates Baptist Church International. And you can see it here. In, the, in those days, we didn't have a church uh, proper. So these are two villas, and we would cut. They, they cut the walls out between the two villas. And the only way that we could actually meet in this church, because there was... Uh, four or five hundred people coming in and out on a Sunday is this church was right next to a mall. They called it Mercado Mall. And it's kind of this Venice theme and it was beautiful. Uh, I ate a lot of uh, KFC Twisters. It's uh, like a wrap. But anyway, that's a long story. Uh, church here, 40 plus nationalities served there. But during our time there, we, we got connected with a guy by the name of Kevin Phillips. And Kevin Phillips started an, a missions organization called, next, the For All Mankind Movement. This was his missions agency. So when we, came, we left Dubai, when Jotham was born, his passport says born in the UAE, United Arab Emirates, came back for a couple years here. And then we went back to that same country and joined this organization, the For All Mankind Movement whose goal was to reach, equip, and send. I'll come back to that in a few moments. Next, I want to show you where this country is. Hit it one more time and there should be a star that goes up. Yeah, watch this. Looks like a bug. Hit it again. It looks like a bug. Whoop. And that's where it's at. Now, for, I know you guys are good in geography, but just in case, this is us right here. And this is the United Arab Emirates right there. Now, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. But go to the next slide. Now, right here, this area highlighted in the globe is something that they call the 1040 window. And when they say 1040, it's uh, latitude or longitude coordinates. I always confuse the two. But, but the latitude coordinate, this coordinates, the 1040 window. And why is this highlighted? Is because we talked about these hard-to-reach places earlier where our shoeboxes went where a lot of the unreached peoples in the world reside. Do you know that the majority and the most of the unreached people groups, the hardest to reach places are in this 1040 window? And I don't know if you can see it there. Where is that star located? Huh? Almost right in the middle. And God has used this country as a way to reach out into this hard to reach, really the hardest re place to reach in the country, in the world, sorry, in the world. And see, back in the, in the olden days, how did the gospel first get transported when Paul and the other people were taking it? They took the Roman roads. Right? And the Pax Romana, the, the peace that, that was guaranteed. And the Roman roads went everywhere. 
But today, you know what God is using to spread the gospel? He's using the airline industry. And do you know that three of the fastest growing and get, becoming three of the largest airline in, uh, companies in the world are based right out of this area. Two of them in the country. Emirates, you can't watch a sporting event without seeing Emirates advertising. Uh, Itihad out of Abu Dhabi and also Qatar. All of them right here in the Gulf region. I think there's no accident that, that, that this part of the world has exploded. Now, what language did Paul speak? That what was the universal language that he went out and spoke and shared the gospel? It was Greek. And what language is God using today? We speak it, although not very well, or at least the Brits would definitely say we don't speak it very well. But English, we speak more American or kind of hick southern, right? Yeah. We cut the G's off. We say I. We do our long I's and all that. But anyway, we put E-R on everything. God's using English and, and that. So let's keep moving. Keep going. We're going to zoom in some more. Let's zoom in to where this country is. You can see this country, United Arab Emirates. Saudi Arabia right next to it across the Gulf from Iran. Next. This is zoomed in more. You've got Dubai up here and down here, Abu Dhabi, surrounded by Oman and Saudi Arabia. Next up. I want to give you just some pictures of Abu Dhabi where we spent the last two years working kind of on the front lines as, as missionaries. You can see this is the, the city for, at the top is a cityscape. And this is the neighborhood where we lived right here. And some of you may be like, David, what, what kind of place did you stay in while you were there? Next, I'll show it to you in, in a moment. First off, there's a sandstorm. You've seen some of these in movies. That's just a sandstorm there on the main highway. Next, and I love this picture because it says, reduce speed, humps ahead. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that perfect? And of course, they're talking about speed humps. But of course, what got in the picture is camel humps. Okay. All right, next. Now, this is where we lived during our time there in Abu Dhabi. We affectionately called it the pink building. And, and right, I'll show you what, kind of where we lived. We stayed, is about one of, these, one of these apartments right here. And the next picture is going to show our view. This is our view from that window up there. And look what's right next to us. This is what, what they call a mosque for kids. For, for those of you that don't know this, this is kind of the, the place of worship for the religion called Islam. And so every morning about 5 a.m. from this minaret, there's a, micro, or a, a speaker here. And it projects that just the call to prayer every morning right outside our window five times a day. So that was just kind of our view there in the neighborhood. Next, this is our UAE team. A uh, mixture of people from different uh, uh, backgrounds and nationalities. Next, we had a smaller team that we focused on more here in Abu Dhabi. You can see Jotham, he was uh, a bit younger then there. This uh, family from uh, Mississippi, from uh, Nepal, uh, from Michigan, uh, Washington, uh, from Pakistan right here. So it's great just to be a part of a team like this from, from different parts of the world. Next, just some interesting facts, and I'll move through this. The national language is Arabic, although you could probably speak to more people in the country if you know English. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. The national religion is Islam, and it is illegal to try to convert someone and you can get up to 20 years in prison on the law books for converting or baptizing a Muslim. Uh, made up of seven different emirates. I showed you that because the sand, the government is an absolute monarchy. Next. There's no permanent rivers in the country. Dubai has the world's longest driverless metro or train. So we'd get in the metro, we'd get in the train, we'd go to the front, and guess who was driving the train? Nobody. Nobody. And you're kind of like, is this safe? But it was while we were there. No accidents. Dubai has the world's tallest building, 163 floors, or 2,717 feet and we, we, Tess and I got to go up to like, what, 120, 130th floor, and you get in this elevator, and, and it's like, boom, 
It was so fast. It's like, whew, and you're up there. But people have been uh, pers- prosecuted or, or uh, jailed for public displays of affection. And so you, that's a no-no. Next. 88% of the population, this is interesting, 88% of the population of the country are foreigners or what they call expat. That's only the second worldwide behind the country of Qatar. It's a part of the empty quarter, which is the largest sand desert in the world. It's not the largest desert. The Sahara is the largest desert. But the largest sand desert in the world, part of that's in the UAE and Saudi Arabia. One of the latest uh, Star Wars movies, I think Ray's Homeland, was filmed there in Abu Dhabi in the empty quarter. It has the largest man-made island in the world. And I'll show you a picture of it in a few moments, okay? Next, there's the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower, 160-some floors. You can see, see the size difference. This is way out. See these other buildings, and boom, all the way up there. Next. Here's some pictures here. I'm going to come back over here. Lamborghini police car, because, you know, Dubai is kind of known for their wealth. The gold souk at the top. Indoor ski slope. I've only been uh, snow skiing once in my life. It was right here. I'll never do it again. I was terrible. Uh, Dune bashing. We go four-wheeling and mudding around here. They go four-wheeling and dune bashing in the sand. First time I went, I was going up and down these dunes, and I just could not stop laughing. It was just uh, so much fun. Here's the man-made islands in the shape of a globe. Man-made island in the shape of a palm. Here's the birds, the tall building, and then another hotel here and here. Next. Okay. Most people know Dubai because of the wealth and the country because of its wealth. But there's another reason. This is the reason we went back and why our organization started their ministry there. You may say, David, what's all those lines? Well, these lines show the immigration from country to country. Now, here's the United Arab Emirates, small country. But look at all the people from like India coming in here. Places like Pakistan. Come here. So many of these people immigrating into the country of the United Arab Emirates. Next. And a big part of these immigrants are what they call common laborers. And these laborers are brought in. They're paid basically uh, hardly any money. They move away from their homes. Oftentimes they're tricked. They're lied to to get into the country And when they get there, they take their passports, so they're basically stuck. Working 60 hours a week, six days a week, and the hot sun, most days were 100 plus. Very hot. And doing all the construction of all these buildings in that country. Next. They'd ride these buses here. No AC. Imagine 100 plus weather, and they just kind of cram on these buses. But then they would place them in what was called labor camps. Because they did not think these people were good enough to stay in the city, so they put them on the outskirts of the city in what's called labor camps. And here's a picture of a labor camp outside, outside. I mean, look at all the people in one labor camp. And then this is a labor camp room. Now look at this small room. Now I don't know how big it is, but you can tell that two bunk beds, two, four, six, eight, ten, ten or twelve men, grown men, living in a room like this. Twelve or so men crammed in a room. All the space they have is their bunk bed and what's underneath it. Making hardly any money. Every bit, of, almost all the money they have, they're sending back home or paying some sort of bank or lender or somebody to loan them money. And you can see the conditions inside. Very horrific. Go next. I think there's more pictures here. Here's more pictures on the outside. Next. More pictures. You can just see lined up out here. Some of the buses they ride. Here's another picture on the inside. This is a group of Nepalese men. And and we'd go in, interact with them, keep going. Some more pictures on the inside. Here they are eating on the floor in, in their rooms. Here's us playing some games inside the rooms. This is a group of Pakistani Muslims that we got to know and we went in and and we would tell stories to them, uh, Bible stories with the hope to share the gospel with them. Keep going next. 
Now, the goal was to reach them with the gospel, proclaim the gospel, hope and pray that they believe. And once they believe, then we started to equip them. Not only equip them in their, their daily life, their daily walk with Christ, but equip them in, in going and sharing the gospel and, and uh, leading people to Christ, baptizing them, and then planting churches. And then our goal was to send them back home because unlike our country, when you can come in and become a long-term resident or a citizen, nobody could become a citizen of that country. So eventually they were going to go back. So the goal was to send these men, and when we had women's group, when, they had some, when we had some women workers, was to send these men and women back to their country as missionaries. Reach them, equip them, send them. How do we do this? I'm going to move through this quickly. Next. A large group evangelism. This is a Christmas party where we share the gospel. Next. Now look at there. Look at all those shoes. In that culture, you come in the house, you take your shoes off. And, and, and uh, friends, if you think your brothers or sisters got smelly feet or maybe your dad has smelly feet, imagine walking into a room with all those shoes. It was not pleasant. Okay, next. Uh, we would do outdoor meetings. This is us at the park. Although one time we were at this particular park and the police show up and uh, that didn't go so well. Our Pakistani translator then had to go to the, the police station the next day and they questioned him. So there was always that threat. Next. Here we go. Shoe boxes. This is the tie-in. We were not a part of Operation Christmas Child, but we took the idea of the shoe boxes and used this as a way to give the gift of love and to then share the gospel and start story groups because most of the men could not read. And so we, we presented the gospel and, and the Bible in story form. So just some examples here. And these guys, not only the gifts inside, they love these boxes. Man, they kept these boxes and reused them for storage. <laughs> You'd see them months and years later. Next, a small group evangelism. This was a... An iftar meal at, at, during Ramadan, they break their fast with an iftar meal. And look, look at outside. Look at what they're eating. They're eating on the ground. And look at all this just garbage all around. Here's a bunch of uh, Pakistani Muslims there. Next. This is inside. And I, I, this picture is actually a, just a Bible study. But I'll never forget sitting in this room here. I'm leading a story. I'm sharing a Bible story. And I look down the ground. And there's bed bugs crawling. All over the ground. Uh, it was the most distracting. And listen, babies have nothing on, on uh, bed bugs to, as far as distraction. But anyway, uh, a wonderful group of believers here. Uh, next, church planting. We tried to plant churches in each of these labor camps. Next, as some of our pastors. Some pictures of baptism. We had this tank and... And I don't know why somebody had all these red colored shirts with the different ties, and that's what we'd always baptize in. But had this kind of water trough, we'd baptize there. We'd go out in the Persian Gulf next, go out in the Persian Gulf and baptize uh, folks that gave their life to Christ next. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 2. I want to read this to you and share a story, and I'm going to wrap it up. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. What you see in this verse, and I remember what's, what's the Great Commission? Make disciples. In this one verse, you see four generations of disciples. I'm going to walk you through it really quickly here. Who's writing this? Paul. Who's he writing to? Timothy, his disciple. And he says to Timothy, The things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. Three. Paul gives to Timothy. Timothy gives to faithful men. And then finally, those faithful men who will do what? They will teach others. Four generations in it. This is how the gospel, this is how discipleship works. Passed on from generation to generation. Uh, go, go next, Mike, and I want to share you some, uh, uh, just a kind of a quick, kind of neat story of these four men. These are four Nepalese men. The one on the top left is a guy by the name of Vishnu. Uh, the organization and, and our, our, uh, our fellow workers had already reached out to Vishnu. He was addicted to alcohol and just in a, a very difficult situation. He was a, uh, let's see here, he's a Hindu. And he accepted Christ. He became a follower of Jesus. And then I, I, I came in, I met him and some of the other brothers. He introduced to us to the guy on the right. 
And you can go to the next slide because it's got some arrows here. Uh, he introduced to us to a guy by the name of Kamal. And as we interact with Kamal, Kamal finally decided to give his life to Christ, although Vishnu eventually went back home to Nepal. Then Kamal, after he came to Christ, he introduced to us to his friend called Suraj. And I've told the story of Suraj. Suraj was a Buddhist. He was a Buddhist from Nepal, but he could speak some English. So I, I got to interact with him. He said, David, he said, I want a Bible in English. Because he wanted to practice his English. He didn't care what was in the Bible. He, he just wanted to practice English. So I said, no problem, I'll get you one. And our organization had given us a bunch of Bibles, and I had one English Bible, and someone had gone through and highlighted many verses in it. And I thought, I, I don't know whose Bible this was, and I don't know what they've highlighted, but it's the Word of God, right? <laughs> I, and I just handed it off to him. Handed it off to Siraj. Didn't see him for several weeks. And when I finally saw Siraj... We were just catching up and checking on him, seeing how he's doing. I said, Siraj, I said, have you read that Bible any? He said, yeah. He said, I've read, I've read all the highlighted passages. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, I, I wonder what was highlighted through there. And he said, David, he said, you know, he said, I'm a Buddhist. My, my whole family, we come from a long family and long, long line of Buddhists. He said, we don't believe that anyone can be raised back to life. You know, they do reincarnation and things like this. You come back as something else. But he said, I got to the point that was highlighted that talked about Jesus being raised back to life, being raised from the dead. And he said, David, he said, I believed it. And I believe it. And, and I, was, I was just blown away. I was just reminded of the power of God. And I tried to talk him out of it. You know, I, I said, and, you know, talking about baptism, things like this. I tried to talk him out. I wanted to make sure that he was ready. I wasn't really trying to talk him out. But I wanted to make sure that he truly believed. And finally, he said, David, he said, if I didn't believe this, I wouldn't be going to get baptized. And so we took him out. We baptized him. Long story short, he led us to Pratop. We shared the gospel with Pratap, and Pratap professed faith in Christ. And finally, he said, you know what? I want to be baptized, and I want to be baptized in the same place where you baptized Siraj. So we let Siraj and, and Kamal go out into the Persian Gulf and baptize him. Four generations that we got to see. And my prayer for us is that we would continue to see generations. Uh, next slide the last, should be the last slide. I was a missionary. Tetch and I were missionaries in the UAE for a short while. But each of us now, God has placed us to be missionaries here in Jackson County. And that's an old map. But, I, but the point is clear. God has called us to share the gospel and to make disciples of all believers. So I'm going to stop there. Next slide should just be questions. Any questions? I, I went through smoking fast and we still have pizza to eat. But does anybody have questions about anything that I've said or anything that we did? Jotham. Yes, Jesus got, uh, Jesus got three gifts when he was a baby. What were they? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very good. All right. Say. How many people what? Oh, in the rooms? Different rooms, different times. But, I mean, you can tell they would take those bunk beds and they would cram them in there, save space as much as they could. And uh, these guys work all week and come in. They'd have to wash their own laundry by hand. They'd have to do their own cooking by hand. I mean, it was uh, the, the life that they experienced. It, it, was, it was very humbling to see. Huh? It was tough. That's a good word, B. It was tough. What, any other questions? What's that? I've, I've got a few. If you, if, you, if you and Lynn want some, Gail, I'll make sure to get you some. No, we kept them out of the parsonage. I assure you, when, my, when I came home, my mama, my mama made sure we didn't bring anything. She's steaming and, and washing and... And, and actually, every night we come home, we had these seal bags. And, and I'd come home, and I'd take my clothes off, and I'd put them directly in that seal bag because I didn't want to bring them in into the house. When I was staying in Dubai for the first for serving at the church, I was living with an Indian man, single man. I was a single man at that time. And, and we went to Bangladesh on a mission trip, which is, used to be part of India, kind of east of, of India. And 
we brought some back with us. And we had them in that house. And they were so hard to get rid of. We had an Egyptian, a couple of Egyptian guys come. And they spent the night. And the next morning, this guy's like, uh, I had these little bugs bite me overnight. And we're like, yeah, we know. Sorry. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, the, the place that was farthest from Christ. Oh, I'll give you an example. I'll show you right about. Okay, so this is India. Bangladesh right here is that little red dot I was just talking about. When I was in Bangladesh, a very Muslim country, the, one of the largest unreached people groups in the world is a, is a Bangladeshi Muslim group. Uh, I, I had a couple of times I went there, and there was a spiritual heaviness when I was there. And you could just sense it. But uh, that's to say there's a little island nation right here that's known, for, known as a vacation spot. It's a place called the Maldives. And if you've, you know anything about seeing these pictures, it's a beautiful place. And, and Tetch actually got to go before I did, and then, then I got to go a couple times. But the Maldives brag and claim that they are 100% Muslim. Now, that's, that's not true because there are actually some believers there hidden in some of these islands. But that's probably to go in a country where they, they claim to be 100% Muslim and they do everything they can to try to keep the gospel from spreading in that place. So that, that, that's a good question. Yeah. All right, other questions? Shoe Which shoeboxes? We, our shoeboxes went to hard-to-reach places. We don't know which country they went to. Yeah. So that was the video with the dark and the light and, and difficult places. So that, that's the challenge is we don't know. We just know they went to hard-to-reach place. And because they went to hard-to-reach place, they won't even release the name of where they went. So, Okay. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to close... And if you guys want to come up, you can look at some more of this stuff, like this one right here. One last thing. And the kids probably don't need this one. But this is what they call a conjure knife. You can see here. And they would take it, and they got these belts, and they kind of loop it in their belt and hang it, kind of like that. So that. But you guys can come up here. I'll, I'll keep this one close to me. Yeah. I know Jonathan didn't even know this. He's been in his house for all these years. He didn't even know this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Brother Ben to lead us in prayer and pray for some of these hard-to-reach places, pray for the UAE, um, and, and, and just say a word of blessing over our food, and we'll, we'll head that way. Amen. You are dismissed. Maybe some of our leaders or adults maybe can stand outside and, and keep an eye on, on the folk, on the kiddos as they head that way and the youth. Yeah.